Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, Well, what is it written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love your Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind, and your neighbor is yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three, do you think, proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. Over the weeks to come, and the months to come, and actually the years to come, we'll continue to revisit some of the things that we've discussed in, in recent weeks. Uh, you will see numerous times the statement of our purpose, which is sharing God's love from the heart of Broken Arrow. You'll see that our vision has been refined to be that we will be an engaged and compassionate body of believers, a spiritual anchor for our community, and a place for disciples of Jesus to worship, serve, and grow, which feeds our mission that we will share the message of Jesus through the witness of our words, our examples, and our acts of compassionate service in our community and around the world. And all of these are fed by these four core values that we're discussing in our morning assemblies in the month of March. Living faith, transformational discipleship, compassionate service, and servant stewardship. Last week we examined stu uh, servant stewardship defined as an acknowledgement that all we possess in this life both physically and spiritually is a blessing from God. Those things are entrusted to us so that we may commit the use of our talents and resources for the praise of His glory, the fulfillment of His will, and service to others. And while we discussed that in detail last week, we didn't connect it to our larger theme for 2016, which is in His image. And it's wonderful that in examining these core values, which we're doing in reverse order, uh, just to accommodate some things that are coming up in the next couple of weeks, uh, that they're intricately tied to the nature of Jesus, the example of Jesus, and how we see servant stewardship in him with the mission that he had, being sent from the Father to redeem mankind. Over and over again, we're going to discuss passages like Matthew chapter 10, verse 25, that say it's, it's enough for the student to be like his, his teacher, it's enough for the servant to be like his master. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, that Jesus left us an example to follow in his steps. And so if we are called to walk in servant stewardship, we're assuming that Jesus exemplified the same himself. And so he did. In John chapter 4, verse 34, Jesus says to his uh, disciples, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. The context here in John 4 is in Samaria near the village of Sychar. The disciples have gone into the village to buy food, hoping that they will be at least welcomed enough by the Samaritan population that they could buy something to eat. And Jesus has that incredible encounter with the Samaritan woman by the well, and he talks to her about living water. And after that discussion and after the course of her life changes forever, after she goes into the village and tells people about Jesus, and many others come to believe in him, the disciples make their way back to the well with the food, food <clears throat> excuse me, 
that they had gone into the village to buy. And Jesus says, I have food that you don't know about. And from a human standpoint, and knowing the, the disciples, you can understand their frustration. We've been gone all this time. We made all that effort. We went into the village, spent all that money, got this food. We get back and you say, you've got food that we don't know about? Another teachable moment, you know, for Jesus. Not that kind of food. We'll eat what you brought in just a minute. But my real food, my real sustenance, what I'm really about is doing the work of my Father. Accomplishing His will. Accomplishing His work. In the prayer that uh, Jesus prays in John chapter 17, Robert shared with us our communion thoughts from John chapter 14. That's that upper room discussion with the apostles before his arrest. In chapters 14, 15, and 16, he will talk to them at length about the fact that indeed he's not going to leave them as orphans. Uh, when he goes to the Father, he'll ask the Father, and the Father will send this other helper, this other comforter, that he would be with them forever. He would guide them into all truth. They wouldn't have to worry what they would say when they appeared before kings and magistrates and governors. The Spirit will t would tell them what to say. And then as we have it divided in, in our Bibles, chapter 17 is this beautiful high priestly prayer of Jesus. And just to set the context for verse 4, which appears on the screen, if you start reading in verse 1 of John chapter 17, then G when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And now verse 4, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you had given me to do. Jesus was made a steward of that work, a manager of that work. He was sent on the Father's behalf. His call, his duty, his meat and potatoes, what he was focused on was doing the will of the Father and accomplishing his work. And now in this prayer, he says, it, it's done. Although I will struggle in the garden, although I will ultimately submit my will to your will, this sacrifice has taken place. It's going to happen. I have accomplished the work as a good manager, as a good steward. And in regard to those that you have entrusted to me, I've been a good steward and I've been a good manager of them. John chapter 17, verse 12, just a little further down in that prayer. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. These apostles weren't just chosen by Jesus for this special mission, given authority over demons, given authority over sickness and disease, and given this message of repentance because of the nearness of the kingdom of God and sent out to, to preach, often going out in pairs. It wasn't that Jesus just selected those. The way Jesus viewed it is they had been entrusted to his care by the Father, and he had done his work, he had done his job of keeping them, of guarding them, with the exception of the one who had decided to betray him. And all of this stewardship is connected to his servant heart. Matthew 20 is the context where the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, comes to him with this request for her boys to sit on his right and his left when he came in his kingdom. While it was a bold request, at least in reading through it this, this past week, something jumped out at me that maybe I hadn't seen before. It does say that she kneeled before Jesus when she made that request. Uh, that was honoring, that was respectful, but, but still, Jesus knows that the mother of James and John, James and John themselves don't understand the nature of greatness in his kingdom, that it comes through service. So when the, the 10 are indignant with the two, because they beat them to the punch and made this request before they thought to ask Jesus, he said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man is not come to serve, but to give his life as a ransom, but, but not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus used his divine power in service to others. Didn't hesitate 
to multiply bread, to multiply fish so that 5,000 men plus women and children could be fed. On another occasion, 4,000 men plus women and children. And yet when it came to his own needs, when he's challenged by Satan, are you hungry? You've been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. Here's some stones. Why don't you turn those into bread? Wouldn't use that divine power for himself, but would use it in service to others. He refused to call 12 legions of angels so that he might be delivered from his hour of trial and delivered from his suffering. But he used his divine power for the deliverance of others from their suffering, from sickness, from disease, uh, from demons. And so Jesus, in the stewardship that God had given him, shows this incredible servant heart. So just as servant stewardship was both taught and modeled by Jesus, so is compassionate service the focus of our discussion uh, this morning. It's a sensitivity to the spiritual, emotional, and physical needs of others expressed through acts of service and deeds of mercy, bringing hope and healing to the hurting within the body of Christ and in our community. Uh, the basic basis, uh, the text that serves as the basis of that could, all, could have also included verse 9 of Galatians chapter 6, that we're not to grow weary in doing good, uh, but, but to keep pressing on, not, not to give up. We'll reap in due season if, if we don't give up. And then Paul writes, as you have opportunity, do good to everyone, especially to those who are of the household of faith. So this value upon which our purpose and our vision and our mission are based is one of compassionate service. And notice at first it's a sensitivity. It's an attentiveness to the needs of others, an alertness to the needs of others. It can't involve self-absorption -absor here. We have to be able to look beyond ourselves. It's a mindfulness of the needs of others, a consciousness, an interest in, a watchfulness. It's really an expectation for the needs of others because you know they're going to exist. And we can walk around with blinders on, we can walk around with our heads down, averting our eyes from the needs of those around us. But a heart of compassionate service will not only be attentive to those things, it will be expecting to encounter such people in need. And then the sensitivity turns into service. It's expressed, as stated here, through acts of service and deeds of mercy. That feeling within us is turned into action. The emotion translates into energy that's expended on, on behalf of others. And we see that in, in the parable of the Good Samaritan, as we often call it. I've told you before, it can be called the parable of the useless priest and Levite. But their basic problem was not just that they failed to act. Their, their root problem was the lack of that sensitivity, the lack of that attentiveness, the lack of, of being tuned in to the needs of others. That, that Whatever they felt, maybe it was disgust, Maybe it was disappointment that they lived in such a violent age that you couldn't even travel the road from Jerusalem to Jericho without falling into the hands of robbers, that people lived in such violence that they would beat a man within an inch of his life, strip him of his clothing, take all of his possessions, and assume that they had finished the job and leave him for dead. Maybe they shook their heads in, in a commentary on the violence of their age, but they felt nothing for that man. There was no sensitivity there, no alertness, no attentiveness. To his needs. Had there been, there would have been at least a possibility of their actions. But as Jesus describes the third man there in, in Luke chapter 10, the first thing it says about him is that he had compassion. He felt compassion. And then that feeling gets translated into action. The emotion gets translated into acts of mercy. So compassion is what you feel. Mercy is what you do. Service is what you do. And this whole parable, as Reese read for us, not only the parable, but the context of the parable, that, that he's asked uh, by this lawyer, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus asked him, well, you tell me what's written in the law. And he quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 6, and he quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 18, the greatest command and the second greatest command, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second command, very much like it, love your neighbor as yourself, Jesus could have chosen anything to illustrate the second greatest commandment in the world. He chose this story. He chose this parable. A parable in which 
Compassion is felt and then mercy is extended through the binding of this man's wounds, pouring on them oil and wine, putting this man on his own animal, walking this man to an end, personally taking care of him for a time until he has to leave, and then leaving money for the ongoing care of the man and a promise to the innkeeper, if you spend more than I've left with you, keep an accounting of it because when I come back by, I'll, by, I'll, I'll reimburse you for anything you've spent in caring for this man. This is how Jesus defines the second greatest commandment. This is how he illustrates that greatest commandment. So this parable should be extremely important to us. And again, that's what we see along this theme of in his image and walking in his steps, becoming more transformed into his image. That's what you see repeatedly in the ministry of Jesus. We would run out of time this morning if I took you to every pa passage where it says that Jesus saw an individual or he saw a group of people and felt compassion for them. Without fail, look for the verbs that follow. Every time it says that he felt compassion, action follows. There's always these, these verbs. He heals, he restores sight, he gives the ability to walk to the lame, he gives the ability to hear to the deaf. He drives out demons for those, from those who are, are torturously uh, afflicted by unclean spirits. And in doing this, Jesus teaches us that doing good is self-authenticating. Doing good is self-authenticating. It's an end in and of itself. Doing good for the sheer goodness of it. Doing good for the sheer joy of it. Doing good for the sheer rightness of it. In Luke chapter 6... Jesus says, if you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But you love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return and your reward will be great. You will be sons of the Most High, for He, our God, is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. And so He says, you be kind to them as well. Even the evil, even the ungrateful, be merciful as your Heavenly Father is merciful. You've been created His image. You've been called to be holy as He is holy. So you do good as He does good. In Mark chapter 3, Jesus is in a synagogue, it's on the Sabbath day, it's a time that's ripe for critique and criticism of Jesus because there's a man in the assembly of the synagogue that morning that has a deformed hand. And they're just waiting for it. They know Jesus' is M.O. He sees people, he feels compassion, and he does something. Here's this man on the Sabbath. Is he going to work? Is he going to heal? And Jesus already knows what they're thinking. And so he asks them a question. Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath? or to do harm, to save life, or to kill. And his critics were silent. And Jesus looks at them, it says there in Mark chapter 3, Jesus looks at them with anger, grieved at the hardness of heart. It upset Jesus greatly when people stood in the way of others doing good. Self-authenticating good. No justification needed doing good. And so Jesus says, you know, they're basically asking in their minds, what case can you make for healing this man? Jesus' mind asks, what case can you make for not healing this man? It's lawful to do good. It's always lawful to do good. You don't need any other reason. You don't need anyone's permission. It doesn't need a defense. It doesn't need a rationale. It's just doing good for the beauty of doing good. So Jesus feeds the hungry simply because they're hungry. He heals the sick because they're sick. He gives sight to the blind because they were blind. He cast out demons because people were held in bondage to these evil spirits. When you think about compassionate service, you can't help but think again of that upper room. Uh, John provides us this story as well of the washing of the disciples' feet by Jesus, verses 12 through 16. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, notice this basic principle again of the disciple is supposed to be like the teacher, the student like the teacher. If I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example 
that you also should do as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Again, this is a self-authenticating act. There were dirty feet in the room that needed to be washed, and no one else in the room had a sensitivity to that need, apparently. No one else had a sensitivity to that need, much less the motivation to do anything about it. And when you look at it, when you look at what Jesus did, something so humble, something so mundane, something so get your knees dirty and your hands dirty in serving somebody else, there's no other reason for him to do it. He's not making a theological point. What doctrinal position is more firmly established because of what Jesus does here? How much nearer were their hearts drawn to Jesus in accepting him as Lord and Christ? Either they had or they hadn't. Eleven pretty much had. One pretty much hadn't. And one of them is going to leave the room with clean feet to rendezvous with the enemies of Jesus to execute a plan of betrayal. Jesus washed his feet anyway. Why? Because his feet needed washing and Jesus loved him. And that's all the justification he needed. Doing good is self-authenticating, and he leaves us an example to do as he does. While we'll get to living faith as one of our values two Sundays from now on on Easter, uh, we'll go ahead and mention it here as well. James writes, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it doesn't have works, is dead. That's going to be a a part of our basis for a discussion of, of living faith in a couple of weeks. The Holy Spirit could have directed James to use any illustration imaginable to get us to see a a, a word picture of what living faith looks like. And he chooses an example of clothing the needy and feeding the hungry. Just as Jesus in Matthew chapter 25 could have used any criteria to describe that separation of the sheep and the goats before the throne of God, what he chooses as as a demonstration of true faith, what he chooses as a demonstration of real compassionate service is, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Jesus chose the meeting of these physical needs as an invariable and undeniable illustration and demonstration of a person's commitment to him. You see the same type thing in in Acts chapter 6, Uh, On Wednesday night, some of us are involved in a uh, high-speed train ride through the book of Acts. Uh, We're we're moving fast. A couple of chapters a a night, you've got to do that if you're going to get through in one quarter. This Wednesday night, we'll get to chapters 5 and 6. And in chapter 6, you see the selection of those seven men who are chosen to make sure that the Hellenistic Jewish widows were being fed on a daily basis. The reason that Stephen and Philip and those other five men are chosen and serve as the first proto-deacons is because there were needy widows who weren't properly being provided for and there were people who were sensitive to their needs. The fact that there were hungry widows was enough justification to get the church together to create a ministry system to meet that needs, meet that need. Widows were hungry, they needed to be fed, that's it. That's all the justification that was needed, full stop, end of story. The need exists, so let's meet that need. And that's the rationale, and it's so beautiful for me to see on a a daily basis and a weekly basis uh, here among you as part of this church family, how that value of compassionate service drives so much of, of what we do that impacts our church family, that impacts our community. On a weekly basis, the food pantry. On a regular basis, the clothing room. Uh, We had Mary Bird's memorial service last, last Tuesday. And that was her niche. That's where her heart was. She would go to garage sales. She would go to estate sales. She would go to auctions. She would go to storage unit sales for units that had been abandoned or bills hadn't been paid. And she would buy things not for her own use. She would buy them to give away. She would bring mountains of clothing to the clothing room so that others could benefit. 
that was compassionate service, our Helping Hands ministry that seeks to meet needs within the church family here, Kids Care, which when you think about it, meets those spiritual, emotional, and physical needs of, of children in our community in New Heights the, the same way. It was so encouraging two weeks ago on Sunday night to hear not just our own people talking about New Heights, but to hear people from our community talking about it. To hear Lisa Ford from the Broken Arrow Police Department talk about her, her grandson, who while he's slow to get up for school during the, the regular year, uh, is up early to come to New Heights. Won't hear of not being driven uh, to be here during New Heights in the summer. To hear from Donna Mossberg, the, the principal over at Rhodes Elementary, who talked about the fact that, yes, indeed, we do live in a relatively economically depressed part of town. Nearly 70% of the kids are on free or reduced price uh, breakfast and lunch. And you would expect that the test scores of those children would be among the bottom uh, of those in, in the school district. And she was proud to announce that the test scores from Rhodes were at the top of the district among the elementary schools. And she attributes a lot of that to the fact that that learning loss isn't taking place during the summer, that, that's being, that, that there's continuity between the end of one school year and the beginning of another school year with, with what they receive in reading and math and science and technology and engineering and all these other fields that, that they study. And, we're feeding them physical needs. Emotional needs are being met. Uh, Rose Cox from Daybreak Services, that's the counseling group that works with children at Rhodes during the school year. They use our facility during the summer to keep contact with those kids, to keep that continuity of care. And so there are physical needs, there are emotional needs, and there are spiritual needs being met. We get to teach those children, you know, Bible for 45 minutes a day, five days a week for, for eight weeks. It's a ministry of compassionate service. Those of you who crochet hats and scarves for Ukraine, those of you who make quilts for cancer patients, those who make those food runs for Hope Harbor, who work with the Contact Christmas Store, who get together the holiday gift baskets around Thanksgiving and Christmas, all of those are demonstrations of hearts of compassionate service. One more time, it's a sensitivity to the spiritual, emotional, and physical needs of others, expressed through acts of service and deeds of mercy, bringing hope and healing to the hurting within the body of Christ and in our community. And that's what Galatians 6.10 talks about. As you have the opportunity, do good to everyone, especially to those in the household of faith, but not exclusively. Everyone means everyone. Make sure you don't neglect in-house needs, the needs of the family. But our goodness has to extend everywhere beyond that. In regard to emotional needs, you'll find on the front of the bulletin a description of uh, a grief seminar that we're going to have on April the 10th. Uh, that's a real emotional need. Some of you are feeling that need very keenly this morning because of the recent loss of loved ones. Some of you are, are still nursing wounds of, of pain and loss that go back years that you're still struggling with. Uh, People in your extended family, neighbors of yours, friends of yours, co-workers of yours, everybody suffers significant loss in their life. Every one of those people can benefit from being here on April the 10th. It will bless your life. You be a key and, and a link in making sure that their life is blessed as well. That maybe more healing can come to their heart and mind and soul because of the messages that John Dobbs is going to share with us that day. And spiritual needs continue to be met. I'm, I'm so grateful that uh, Ken began bringing Marla with him to services here a few weeks ago and has been talking to her about his love of God, his devotion to Jesus Christ, how he became a Christian. And we rejoiced yesterday as she put on Christ in baptism. Next week, we'll move on to transformational discipleship, living faith, uh, the week after that on, on Easter Sunday and then get back into our we'll be hitting a new quarter at that point focusing on love as I have loved you we'll still be circling back throughout the year to be holy as I am holy and this overall theme of, of in his image hopefully this will just get ingrained in our consciousness if there's some spiritual need that that you have this morning some emotional need that you have that you want to make known 
Uh, the shepherds are here to, to minister to you and to help you. We would love to assist you in being baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, as Marla did yesterday. If you've not yet made that step of faith and, and act of submission to Jesus Christ, uh, if you need help, if you need encouragement in, in your walk of faith, if there are losses that you've suffered, wounds that, that are upon your heart that need healing, we would love to pray with you and, and help bring that healing that's so much needed. Please make those known as we're standing together and singing.